that doesn't arise from physical injury is no less real than pain that does in the brain that is precisely the same for the solution to chronic pain may lie more in what goes on around us than what is going on inside us of all the implications of the new theory of pain this one seems to be the oddest and far more reaching it has made pain political oh what's the name though goldi goldi so you must see the website and so I've been doing research for the past uh, 20 years after my PhD and uh, I'm extremely research uh, oriented person and after that uh, I quit my job and then that's when I thought of starting uh, my own company and then the next thing was what should I work on and uh, I have a dog uh, her name is Goldie and she had osteoarthritis for the past 3 years and my experience with osteoarthritis talking to veterinary doctors and also the kind of supplements and medication they used to give was such that uh, i realized that there is no pain medication also available for it as of today effective pain medication also although there are some short term medications ns aids which are given and uh, which is to some extent effective but it also seems to have some side effects and that made me uh, go back and then look at the research papers and then i found uh, that there is one potential uh, pathway which can be uh, targeted for me to come up with some intervention for uh, pain in osteoarthritis and when what i mean by pathway is that uh, some of these cells have uh, a th- particular sequence of events happening inside them and then as a result of this there is an outcome so that outcome is actually a pain in this particular pathway that's what i mean so when i'm uh, basically blocking this pathway the pain is prevented so to put it in simple terms that's what it actually means and then i started this company this company i named it as um, poth p a w t h neo is new and the reason uh, for this was uh, multiple one is since my first project was inspired from goldy uh, my dog and that's how the name p a w t h but a, a deeper meaning was uh, to have this logic that in order to come up with something innovative for humans i wanted to not only test it in animals specifically uh, companion animals like dogs but also come up with a solution for them before even going to the higher uh, organism like humans so that was the logic behind coming up with this uh, name pothneo pain that doesn't arise from physical injury is no less real than pain that does in the brain it is precisely the same for the solution to chronic pain may lie more in what goes on around us than in what is going on inside us of all the implications of the new theory of pain this one seems to be the oddest and far more reaching it has made pain political this is an excerpt from the book complications by adil guante Incidentally when I was doing my research on understanding pain research in India I chanced upon this a chapter in this book called the pain perplex it talks about how pain is not just a matter of science it is social it is political it is cultural having that all said in this episode we are not going to understand what are the social and cultural nuances of pain rather we are going to look at what does science say about understanding pain hi this is anand patmanabhan and you are watching the ground reports hop on in this episode to understand what is the level of research that goes into unlocking the secrets of pain around 10 kilometers away from manirudas home is where the startup path neo is located we are after a startup incubated inside jodi institute of technology he wants to develop a protein based therapeutic for managing arthritis related pain the idea is to select a fragment of the target protein that plays a role in arthritis and use it as a therapeutic agent for managing pain this particular protein naturally exists in full length within the body the startup focuses on a reductionistic approach to separate the protein and tweak it to function slightly different than the whole protein in the body this particular protein naturally exists in full length within the body the reason why i chose a protein therapeutic which i termed as natural close to whatever present in the body is because uh this 
can be administered long term as compared to NSAIDs which can only be administered for a short period of time let's say three days five days and you need to take a break you cannot take it forever uh, specifically when they are like COX-1 COX-2 inhibitors and they are known to have a lot of side effects associated with this and also in case if people have comorbidities then they are also at a higher risk of uh, all these side effects with NSAIDs so this protein Therapeutic can then also cater to the niche population who have comorbidities, number one. Number two, it can also be administered long term. So these are the objectives of me coming up with a protein therapy. So even before, like I said, even before you start working with the even mice as experimental animal or any other animals, I'll have to do a lot of studies uh, after I have the protein as well. So that includes ensuring that the protein is folded properly and then next is also ensuring that that is actually doing its function i use cells and then uh, i test it on the cells to check that it is actually doing the same function like i mentioned earlier pathway right so that can be tested even before you test it in animals and a lot of these experiments safety experiments also needs to be done before even i start doing mice uh, and then uh, of course that is uh, if humans again it's an another uh, kind of another set of experiments that needs to be done. All of regulatory guidelines are there before you go into the next stage. So I'm very much at the early stage where, uh, so I have got a funding from Nidhi Prayas and I'm incubated at Atal Incubation Center, Jyoti Institute of Technology, wherein I'm conducting these experiments uh, to begin with expressing the therapeutic protein uh, in a microbe and uh, purifying it. So this funding is for me to also develop the proof of concept wherein I will be ensuring that the therapeutic protein is actually working as I expect it in a cell-based system. So I'm very much at the early stage of the project. Aniruddha is still continuing his research. Now, far away from his startup and at the Indian Institute of Science, Arnab Barik, a neuroscience researcher at the Center for Neuroscience, along with his team of 13 researchers and 300 mice models, is exploring a pathway of hunger and stress to look for better ways to manage pain. First, their objective is to find out how stress affects pain, then explore ways to alleviate pain without causing stress to the body. Yeah, so uh, pain has been studied for centuries and with the advent of molecular tools and advanced microscopy and behavioral analysis tools and computational tools, uh, we have been really focused on uh, studying the neural circuits and neural mechanisms of pain for the last 25 to 30 years. And it has been particularly important more recently because there is this opioid crisis in the US. So what happened was there is very high dosage of uh, Opioids, opioid drugs or painkillers had been prescribed to patients and uh, they got addicted to it and they started doing other sort of opioid drugs or fentanyl, etc. So there has been the opioid pain, a lot of people died uh, because of that. In India, we have the reverse problem. We don't have access to opioids or we don't have access to painkillers. Um, in can say patients like, you know, um, sciatica or even cancer patients, the pain can be so unbearable that uh, you sort of want to kill yourself. Right, my my lab uh, or my group is focused on primarily two questions. So one is how stress and pain interacts with each other. So as you all know, that a lot of pa patients with chronic pain also have chronic stress and anxiety, and as well as when you have chronic stress and anxiety, your pain worsens. And uh, so we want to know how the stress part of the brain and the pain part of the brain, they interact with each other, how they are talking to each other. How is the pain part causing stress, making stress worse, and how is the stress part making pain worse? So, uh, so what we do is we have different tools at our disposal. We can trace circuitry. So what do you mean by that? We can physically map uh, neural circuitries in the brain and spinal cord very, in a very specific manner. Uh, we use various gen transgenic mice, uh, viral tools, genetic uh, sort of uh, molecular dye, uh, sorry, fluorescent dyes, etc. And we use stereotaxic injections to deliver them at a very precise location inside the brain. And there is this two very important sort of aspects of pain, a components of pain. One is a sensory component, and the other is called the emotional component. Sensory component is just the physical hurting of it. The emotional component is the associated negative emotions with it. 
and now we can try to dissect circuits that are uh, uh, sort of controlling the sensory component and also controlling the sense emotional component. And why is it important? Because ideally, when you give a painkiller or you want to treat pain, a complex, as I said, it's a complex symptom, which is not just the sensory hypersensitivity, but also this emotional hypersensitivity, it should be able to take care of both. So that will be the ideal therapeutics or the therapeutic strategy. And if we know and try to understand how this emotional, how the sort of the pain sensory component is talking to the emotional components and vice versa, we might be able to solve it one day. We can actually record from neurons at a single cell level. So why is that uh, important or why is that uh, uh, so cool? What is so cool about it? Uh, our brain has billions of neurons and so does uh, in an animal, a small animal, mammal just, such as a mouse. So if you want to say that region X is involved, uh, it's not sufficient to say the entire region is involved. What you want to know is that single, at this very single cell level, which is, has a diameter of uh, 20 to 30 microns, and you want to say that at a very single cell level, how they're responding to painful stimuli, and how they're changing with pain or stress. So if you have that, you can, with the techniques that we have today, we can go down to that granular level. So what we do is we, we express a calcium sensor in the, a fluorescent sensor in the, in the neurons of our interest. And what it does is that uh, whenever these neurons are active, they start blinking. And then we can put a lens on it. Yeah, so, so you're putting a camera on it, right? Uh -huh. But there has to be a lens okay. that goes inside. Okay. So we're looking, we're recording from deep brain regions. So this is a sort of, pris it's called a pr cylindrical prism lens. So there's a cylinder, which is it's a green lens, the cylindrical lens with very high uh, sort of numeral aperture. Uh, and then there's a prism sitting at the end of it. So what it does is, if there is a cell activated here, it bounces off, it goes up the lens, and then when you put the camera on it, it can see it, and you can record it, which you saw there. And this can be implanted directly on the mouse head, and we can record the activity of the neurons as the animal behaves. So, one of the recent papers that just recently got accepted was looking at this region called rostral ventromedial medulla. It's a tiny nuclei at the base of the brain, and that exists in us primates, in uh, mice and rats. And classically, over the last 40 years, it has been thought that how opioids uh, cause analgesia is targeting this nuclei and inhibiting uh, the pain circuits in the spinal cord, so which is known as the descending pathway. And um, so that's what classically been known. And what we found was very interestingly that this RVM also projects to the brain. So the, the sort of accepted idea was the only way that RVM plays a role in pain perception and experience is by modulating pain thresholds, sensory pain thresholds, uh, by projecting to the spinal cord. But what we found is no, like RVM also projects back to the brain. Uh, so, so, uh, so classically what is known is RVM is receiving inputs from all over the brain and then projecting to the, and projecting to the spinal cord and that's how our brain is controlling brain thresholds, right? But what we find is that RVM projects back to the brain, it's also giving certain kind of feedback and that can also, it also is involved in the emotional aspects of pain. So RVM is a, what we find now is our evidence suggests that RVM is not just important for pain, sensory pain threshold modulation, but can also independently play a role in sort of the emotional components of pain. Uh, hi, so I'm at the Center for Neuroscience at the Indian Institute of Science. So here Mr. Arnab Barik and his whole team, an entire team uh, as a lab that exclusively focuses on pain. Uh, for instance, how are the neurons adapting to pain or what kind of neural cross wirings play an important role in understanding the pain? Barik's research is fundamental and may take time to reach millions of patients who are waiting in bed to ease their pain. At the Ramiya University of Applied Sciences in Bangalore, physician as well as neuroscientist Dr. Sahadev Shankarappa is aware of such patients longing for a cure. Right. Uh, my name is uh, Sahadev Shankarappa. I'm a professor in the Department of Biotechnology uh, within the Faculty of Life and Allied Health Sciences uh, in Ramaya University of Applied, Sci uh, uh, Applied Sciences in Bangalore. 
Another interesting part of uh, pain is in cancer. Now, as we all know, in certain, not all cancer, but particular types of cancer uh, tend to go down this route where it becomes very painful. Uh, pancreatic cancer is an example. Uh, bone cancer is another example. Now, in these uh, cases, um, what we see is, uh, what we are interested in is trying to see the crosstalk between the cancer cells themselves and the nerve terminals that are in the vicinity. Um, a lot of papers and people from other labs abroad as well have looked at specific signals that happen between the two types, between the cancer cells and the nerve uh, terminals. Uh, people have observed that cancer itself changes the way the nerve terminals behave and the other way around as well. The nerve terminals behave the way cancer cells stick to each other, uh, how they divide, and that is quite important. Uh, I'm not saying that this might play, be a phenomena in all type of cancer, but specific type of cancer. Uh, and then once this interaction occurs, there is also um, um, studies where we have seen pain occurring. And cancer-induced pain tends to be quite challenging to treat. And uh, uh, opioids is a group of drugs that are generally used, and they quite they're quite quite effective uh, that way especially in later stages of cancer and palliative care but uh, that is something also that we are very interested in so the pain story does not end here because if you look at the pain or if you look at the dire situation of pain in india there are millions of people who are waiting for the opioid like medications to reach at their bed to ease their pain and this is a policy story on its own but for the video, we are going to stop here. If you really want to understand how the policy works and what has been the change since the early ban in 80s of opioid-related medications, you are going to look at our full story to understand this. See you next time with a new story. This is Ananda Patmanabhan from The Ground Report at The Print signing off.